Are you ready for the weekend yet? We have events, news, and a guest for you to enjoy this Lake Life weekend. Hello and welcome to another episode of Lake Life Weekend Podcast. I'm Dirk, I'm your host, and we are approaching weekend 33 already here in Autotel County in West Central Minnesota. And I'm extra happy to have met with Sarah Watson, who opened a new restaurant in the area, because I love cooking, I love good food, and I, I'm always uh, trying to find new destinations to experience and enjoy. And you will hear the full story of her journey, um, learning how to cook, uh, working in bigger places, opening restaurants in the Fargo Muhead res- area, and now taking over the old pickle factory with her friend Terry Trickle and converting it into one of the nicest small little restaurants in the area, in my opinion. So stay tuned to hear more about that. And also don't forget to go to our lakelifeweekend.com website to find more stories, news, and also recipes on a regular basis. And we have a map for you to find at weekendnow.com where you can check out destinations to visit like hiking trails, biking trails, dog parks. And please also email us to hello at lakelifeweekend.com with ideas and suggestions for our future program. We are working on our new magazine edition, the fall magazine, which will go into print in a couple weeks and will be out on the stands early September. Thank you for tuning in. And I don't want to keep this much longer to enjoy this interview with Sarah Watson. Have a great weekend ahead. Welcome to our interview part. I'm here with Sarah Watson of Blackboard. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Thank you for coming out. Uh, I know that you're really busy with your new restaurant and getting everything set up and uh, grooved in, I guess. Um, uh, thank you really for coming out. Um, I have experienced and enjoyed your restaurant uh, a couple times these past weeks, and uh, I'm very happy to have that addition uh, locally. And uh, I wanted to meet who is behind it. And I know that uh, you have a friend, uh, partner, Terry, who couldn't make it today as part of the operation and the place. Um, Before we deep dive into the restaurant and the story behind it, because I think you open it with a concept in mind. It was the former pickle factory and now you revamped the whole structure and environment. Um, But tell us a little bit more about Who is Sarah? Where is she from? What has she done before? And I think your whole family is in hospitality or in restaurant business. I think that would be great to hear. So who is Sarah? Well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And uh, I guess um, I don't really know where to start. I go. I go sorry, it's the train. It's, okay. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's pretty authentic here in Peru. <laughs> that's, that's very good. Um, I, I go back to the, the love of hospitality and culinary arts. Um, you know, it, go, it goes back more than 20 years. Um, I think my first jobs as a teenager were in uh, restaurants in Fargo. Um, in fact, uh, the funniest thing really is my, my business partner currently, uh, her and I go way back to kindergarten and high school. Wow. And when we both were 16 years old, we worked at the airport in Fargo at the little restaurant. and. We worked there together all through high school. Went our separate ways, and here we are now. Um, wow. Yeah, it's kind of a, a good, we can come back to that later. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I went to college. I went to the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, um, have an art history degree from there, and worked in restaurants to get my way through college, and took my art history degree uh, to the museums and preferred my restaurant career. Is that true? <laughs> so that is true. Um, and so off I went to Colorado thinking I would ski and snowboard a lot. And uh, I enrolled and um, I had to get, apply. I got accepted into an apprenticeship program in Summit County, uh, specifically Keystone Resort. And it was a three-year apprenticeship program. And that, that's I just fell in love with cooking. And my, my 
three years there, I think I went skiing and snowboarding three times because we were in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> so if I may interrupt, yeah. uh, apprenticeship program is very familiar to the German education system, and yeah. I did not know that there exists a three-year, it's kind of like a kind of a combination of chef school uh, or culinary school and on the job. Absolutely. Sounds exactly like Germany. It yep. Give me a little bit more detail about that. Oh, it, it was a fantastic way to learn. Yeah. Um, it was we we did do our book work, um, but uh, for myself personally, I I love to read cookbooks. I love to read uh, recipes. I don't really know how to do it until I try it. Yeah. And uh, I think that's specifically true for any restaurant work. You can read all about how to set up a hotline. You can read about how to break down salmon or uh, you know a side of beef if you want to do that. But you don't know how to do it until you do it. And so it was very hands-on. I had opportunities out there to learn everything from butchery to pastries to um, breakfast service, uh, fine dining. Um, there was a very nice uh, fondue restaurant yeah. <laughs> and another German restaurant right on the property that I was able to work in. Um, the, the people I trained with out there were fantastic. All of the other apprentices, the employees, everybody was on board to learn. And so it was a fantastic environment. Um, it, it, the, the resort at the time was, it was through Vail Resorts. And so we had opportunities to travel to their other resorts and learn from other chefs. Was that an in-house program or is that organized through the state of Colorado? Explain it, that a little yeah, bit because I, it's I really will. unique, it's, new to me here. It's very unique and it, it worked out really well. To me, it was a brilliant move by Vail Resorts. They partnered with Colorado Mountain College uh, so our, our classroom work was through the college, and then the apprentice work was basically, um, we had a logbook of items we had to learn how to do, and a, a certain amount of hours we had to spend in the kitchen, which yeah. was a lot, which, you know, hence I only went skiing three times. <laughs> Once a year. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm not on a powder day. We were busy those days. I learned right away. <laughs> so... Um, uh, no, it was that was a, that was the best experience. It was great. That's where I met my husband, um, and we stayed out there for another year after I was done with school. Um, came back to Fargo Moorhead to visit my family, and we were in. We by that time we had our second child on the way, and wanting to own our own business. And Colorado is very expensive to start a business in, and so we we applied for some of the other resorts. Um, we hemmed and hawed and our, uh, came down to the options of Jackson Hole or Fargo. Okay. We picked Fargo. We picked Fargo. Our friends in Colorado went, what in the world? <laughs> Fargo's really nice. <laughs> and it's a great place to raise a family. And then we are right here by the Lakes Country. No, I agree. So I agree. When was that? That was 2003. Okay. So uh, we got back here and... Uh, Eric became at the time, um, right now the restaurant is currently called uh, Maxwell's in West Fargo. Yeah. At that time it was Littlefields. And Littlefields, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, uh, how many, six, 17 years ago? So Eric was the executive chef there. I uh, picked up a job at the Plains Art Museum, which I loved. We still, I still have a wonderful um, relationship with the folks there and do a lot of catering. Um, second child was born and we sat in our little apartment and I said, Eric, I'm going to uh, start a catering company. And he <laughs> thought I was goofy and so I did. I sat at my weird little printer at our table in our tiny little apartment with a baby and a three-year-old and wrote a menu, walked around Fargo Moorhead with the children and dropped off brochures <laughs> and suddenly people started calling. And I was like, oh my gosh, I better learn how to professionally answer the phone <laughs> instead of hello. <laughs> So I started picking up some catering, which I illegally did out of our little apartment in Fargo and picked up a few more bigger jobs and went and so borrowed my... So lunch catering, uh, a corporate uh, event catering? Uh, um At the time, it was mostly lunch and okay. dinner, and then that quickly came into corporate, and I quickly had to learn how to uh, or look for a professional kitchen to work out of. And oh, so you, you prepared at home? Oh, in my that. apartment. Oh. And then when I needed more space, I moved into my parents' house and <laughs> used their kitchen, too. Um, and then I was like, oh. And pretty soon it, it, it grew and grew, and Eric was able to quit his job and come on board to help me. We started our catering business first and ran that for um, quite a few years. And we still uh, have a lot of those same clients and just feel very lucky that we were embraced by the community. Yeah. Um, during that time, we opened a, opened and sold um, three restaurants. 
Oh really? Yep. So. So fill us in. So first of all, you're very entrepreneurial, and you're oh, a yes. husband and wife team. Yep. And you're building um, spaces, places, restaurants. Who, which one were the? Th Three. The three. We were after um, Littlefield sold to a, a corporate group of folks, and um, we went back on board as operating partners. And that restaurant was called Maxwell's, and it's in West Fargo. It still exists. It's fantastic. Yeah, I've been there. Yes, um, and that my brother-in-law is the, one of the owners now and a manager there. He I came see. on board with us back then, and we were all there together for a while. Um, Eric and I. We get a little itch once in a while, you know, I guess I would call it. And so we were, they had a good staff. They had what they needed. We were ready to move on. Um, an opportunity came in downtown Fargo, uh, which now is Mezzaluna. Was it a silver? No, what was it before? Silver that? Moon. It was yep. a silver moon. It was a silver moon. And uh, they um, closed and it sat vacant for a little while. We went in there with the intention of running our catering company out of there. And yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So and then. In the back with the glass window. Yep, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then we were going to run the space just as an event center. Okay. Well, that quickly changed into, why don't we just open it as a restaurant? Yeah, and the bar, uh, it's a beautiful space. It's beautiful. It really is. So, uh, And I don't take any credit for that uh, design. That was the folks that ran the Silver Moon. They had a good eye for that space. Yeah. Um, so we felt lucky to get in that space, and uh, five years later, um, we had a manager and a chef working for us that were fantastic, that both wanted to see more momentum in their career. Um, really, at that time, what we were noticing in order to provide that opportunity for our, our, our coworkers was maybe for us to get out of the picture. Um, so we probably spent about six months kind of training them the business side, this side, you know, and, and we still are close with them. They run it completely well on their own. But, you know, we all sit and brainstorm once in a while, like, did you ever have this happen? You know, what? Mm -hmm. so uh, we have great relationships with them. Towards the end of Mezzaluna, we got into another, found another opportunity in Moorhead, which is uh, Rustica. Yeah, John Alexander's. It's a John Alexander's yeah, before, yep. Yeah. So similar situation to Mezzaluna. Um, that they, they decided to uh, dissolve their business and it's that beautiful space kind of sat for a little while and and then you added uh, the tavern we did yeah it was John Alexander's it was owned by the same folks um, and then they had John Alexander's and the tavern part was Juano's so it was more of a Juano's yeah yeah it yeah, was Juano yeah I met it him it was a cool little uh, like a little Mexican cantina. Yeah. It was very cool. Yeah. Um, but we went in there not wanting to do two separate businesses, but we always wanted this pizza oven tavern sort of thing. Yeah. Um, we tried to operate both Mezzaluna and Rustica at the same time, which for us, we were thankful for really great people that worked with us. Um, but when Taylor and Joe were ready to take Mezzaluna, that was... Your exit? We were yep, able to just focus on Rustica. And, Five and years that later. Was, five, was that five years ago already? Yeah, about, well, now probably six years, because now okay. the new owners of Rustica have had that for about a year, so. Oh, you gave that up, to, uh, you handed it over as well? Same thing, yep, same as Mezzaluna, we sold that, and then we said, well, if we're going to sell this to Anna and Micah, who, they're fantastic, if you've been to Rustica, they are just killing it, um, what are we going to do next? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm too tired to start something new, and this was a year ago. And so we, you know, our, um, fell in with uh, National Hospitality Services and said, well, we've always been interested in the hotel business. And a lot of the way they operate went back to our history. In the resort. In the resort. Sure. And I, I liked the hotel environment. I liked the fact um, that we had in-house guests, not yeah. only just the restaurant. And it was folks from out of town, travelers. Everybody had a cool story. Yeah. Um, not that our local people don't, but you know, it, it's always something new. There's and, something and new. And a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and even those guests that traveled from out of town became regulars. You know, if they were business folks that came for monthly meetings, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was fun to greet them by first name. You know, if they would let us. Um, but it, that was great. And then COVID happened. Um, so Eric so is now still we are in 2020. <laughs> now so we're we in arrived 2020. in 2020. <laughs> right. uh, uh, okay. So um, I was the food and beverage director at the Delta Marriott, and as things started to uh, drop off the schedule because of COVID, you know the writing just was just March yep, of this year. Right. The writing was basically on the wall as to where you know salary positions were going, and uh, Eric is, is still the corporate chef, out, or well, I don't know, executive chef out there, and running things, but I knew that 
we, we saw the writing on the wall that they didn't need a food and beverage director for a while. Okay. So you know. So you were pretty much let go. Exactly. Yeah. Just that recently. Okay, and then. Yeah. Well, you know, we we Terry, my friend, and I, we've been friends for since kindergarten, and so we talk a lot. And and she's always helped us in every restaurant or every everything we've done. She's had many of her own very successful businesses, and. One of them is painting and restoring. So when we get to the blackboard story, uh, well, anyone that was there a few months ago would see a big transformation. Um, I think I was just venting to her on the phone one day about what I was going to do. You know, I'm just not one to. Obviously, I had a baby, 20, you know, six, 17 years ago, and started a business. So I was like, I don't know, what should we do? There's that little restaurant out by our our lake. Our lake. You live on a lake. Well, we have our families do. Okay. So we, on Spirit Lake, both Terry, her family, and my family both have uh, lake houses on Spirit Lake. And so the pickle factory was somewhere near and dear to us, and it's been for sale for a while. And yeah. I said, well, what are we going to do? Maybe we should just buy the pickle factory. And I was just venting to her, and then she said, okay. And that was in April, May? Yeah, it was, we, we closed on May 27th. So we called my cousin, who's a realtor, and said, we have this crazy idea. And he said, do you want to go look at it tomorrow? So we did. And then, you know, started the paperwork right away. And, and, there, and here we are. So, you know, <laughs> who opens a restaurant bar during COVID? <laughs> there you go. When everything is shut down, you're planning the future. I love it. So you're well, very optimistic. You're very energetic. I, can, yeah, I know. I you saw have to be. <laughs> you're energetic. You're very optimistic. And you took opportunity to transform a local destination from the pickle factory into blackboard That's okay it. so it's the whole idea is that new i had no idea it is very new we, we came up with blackboard and we brainstormed uh probably for one afternoon and you know it, it the history of the place is neat being an old school house and and then that blackboard idea just kind of stuck and our our minds just started going uh tell us more so it's the what township so i i know that in every Township, there's one designated parcel with a school. So, what is the history okay. about? Uh, did it serve 100 years ago up to Virgus, or wh what was oh, the school? Do I wish know? I knew all of that, and I know um, a lot of the neighbors probably do, and that's something I would like to spend more time learning about. I Just can connect you with the Auditor Historic Society. We had Missy Ames in our program a couple times, and uh, we will find the the depth, the truth. That would be great. We will. I will connect you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so what did you know so far? Well, we knew it was a, a, a schoolhouse. It looks we knew. Like it. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, we knew about uh, it's Dora Township, by the way, Ach, and uh, we knew the the names of the restaurants that had been in there previously. Um, we were pleasantly surprised. You never know what you're going to walk into in some of these old buildings. Um, we we were pleasantly surprised at the size and um, of the kitchen and the equipment that was in the kitchen. That basically sold us on the idea because that the equipment is a lot of money. You know, and, it, and it, it, it's old and we constantly have repairs, but every business I've gone into has been like that. So it's nothing new to Terry and I to know. Yeah, the, the hood system or like that, I mean, the whole kitchen is a, a, a very uh, expensive European sports car. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, very, very. And, uh, with so that was already in there, so you had uh, something that was of a true asset to the whole building, Correct. the structure, okay? Yeah. The yeah. heart was there. The heart was there. And so then we had felt like we were, okay, well, we have that. That just needs a little bit of elbow grease, like anything. Just, you know, let's clean, let's clean and make it ours. And, and then we were able to, with Terry's talent, um, she had this vision for the way it should look. And I, I'm, that's not my talent, um, that's hers. And I was like, do you, do you want me to paint? And I would probably be in her way if I tried to paint like she does. <laughs> so, so she went to town on that, and it, it, the transformation is amazing. Did you restructure the, I, I don't remember the pickle factory to instead. I know when you enter now, uh, um, you have the bar to the left, straight ahead is the kitchen, so, and um, to the, yard to the to the parking lot side we have the bar no windows and then the window side to the yard or backyard or, or front beer lawn. garden front lawn sorry about that <laughs> that's where <laughs> tables are sitting so yep. is that completely restructured no Other, that it is, was the layout kind yep, of so. that was absolutely the layout um we we did the fresh paint and 
Uh, new screens on the porch. Oh, um, the outside uh, is completely uh, now different looking. And, oh yeah. And you, the the deck was there already, but you added a lot of uh, seating under the trees. Yes. Which it, is my favorite spot outside. It's great. It's great. We have on Thursdays. I I think you've been there on a Thursday. When yeah. We have um, music. Music and music on the lawn, and it just you know, last night was just fabulous. It was a beautiful night to be out. It wasn't too hot. Wasn't windy. I mean, it, people were just really enjoying themselves, and that's what we want. That's the goal of the place. Is we're not trying to be fine dining. We're not trying to, we're not trying to really be anything other than a nice spot with good food, and good drinks, and hopefully people have fun. Yeah, tell <laughs> so. us like the 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 mo the unique part to me is the the cooking. Yeah. Because it's it's not. I mean, I love burgers. Don't get me wrong, and I like a deep fried fish. Fine but uh, not all the time yeah. and uh, i think you bring your talent and your creativity to full blossom right like uh, tell us about the menu the menu will change often right now you know if you've been there week by week it, there's some items people will recognize that probably will be mainstays um the bacon wrap meatloaf which makes me i it just makes me kind of laugh I, that, some of the food that i have on there is supposed to be kind of whimsical and maybe like uh 1970s maybe 1980s you know we have the crock a little smokies that's something I, I just find these funny things that I'm like oh that's kind of funny I wonder if people would enjoy, enjoy that, that. <laughs> and and they do and we get interesting you know fun comments um, we have uh, I don't know we did I, we just changed the menu we come up with funny things my sister makes us great checks mix And so I threw that on the menu for a while. It's a bar snack. <laughs> so it's just Chex Mix, but it was going out the door. I said, when are you going to make more of that for us? Because it's a favorite family treat. Okay. Um, we have some of uh, Terry's family favorites on there, too. Um, so it's a very personal menu. It is, very personal. And the, like, oh, the chicken cordon bleu is a bestseller. Oh, yeah, and my son had that. It's really and he, good. He said, and, I, and, and he's a, a totally we are burger friends, right? I mean, he's 11. Yes. Um, program knows about my son, Harry, but... I said like, well, maybe tomorrow we go somewhere to have a burger. Why don't we um, try out here the chicken? I mean, chicken is a kids friendly. And uh, he said like, okay, I'll take the chicken cordon bleu. And and when while he was eating, literally he said, um, looked at me, I'm so glad I did not order the burger. Oh, that makes me that makes me so happy. Eleven year old. Eleven year old. I was uh, <laughs> a proud father uh, for introducing him to to a food experiment, and it was it was fun. Yeah. Oh, that makes me really happy. We yeah, have a burger on the menu for those that love burgers. It's a good burger. It's a very good burger. Yeah, I, but, um, I had it too later. Oh, that's good. <laughs> At a different yeah. day. Yeah. I feel like in the area, there's a lot of places that serve really good burgers, and it's you know Agreed. I, I um, didn't want to be another one of them. Will we have a burger? Yes, people love burgers. Will we have a lot of other things? Yes. Uh, this week I have, um, which I, I love, it's a, it's a vegetarian option. Um, and it'll probably will steaks. I just think it's fun to make and it's really pretty and it tastes good. It's a roast portobello mushroom, a stuffed portobello mushroom, but then we do a variety of vegetables, whatever's in season. But right now it's a, a sweet potato mash inside the mushroom, um, garlic, roast garlic, uh, braised spinach, roast beets, Gorgonzola cheese. It's just kind of cool. It's a stack of color, and mm -hmm. I like that. And it's on a bed of wild rice with a mushroom sauce. Um, mm. That flu has been flying out the door, which mm. that's kind of fun. It's really pretty. Um, I'm really, maybe it's the art history. Maybe that degree did come in handy. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> like, I can I see know. that. Like I, the picture. I very much, the plate is a palette, you know, and, and, and it's fun at Blackbird because a lot of it, you've been in there, and a lot of our food runners and the uh folks that are helping us are Terry and I's children. And they're really on board with this. They think it's really fun to be part of. And I think they're really, um, we have between the two of us, seven kids, two sons, the rest are five daughters. Um, the boys are older. My, my son Miles is 21 and he has a painting company. He painted the outside of Blackboard. Oh. And uh, Terry's son Scott is 18 and he works in concrete. Um, so they like to come and just enjoy the place, not work. But the girls are all on board working. So I have fun showing them basically like the plate is a palette. You know, the, the reason I point the asparagus this way, that should be one o'clock. That's how you should set it down in front of the guest. So when the guest sees the plate, it's visually, uh, I don't know. Appealing, yeah. 
and I don't think a lot of places do that, and that's just something I've done forever, and I don't know if it came from culinary, I mean, I think that's what we did in, as an apprentice. A lot of the kitchens I worked in, some kitchens, you know, the breakfast places are like, here's your eggs and bacon, whatever, and even eggs and bacon, I'm like, well, the bacon should go this way. And <laughs> well, I think the meat is always in the lower left, and then it's like draped around. I mean, that's how my mom arranges the plate, too, and it's always set in a certain direction that you have access to your meat here, right. easy, with knife and fork. Yeah, I can see it. See. I'm very happy. That's why I maybe connect so well to you. Well, maybe that's kitchen. it. It's kind of like, oh, well. Yeah. No, but it's it's also, yeah, it's a picture. We also have a saying in German, uh, das Auge ist mit. It means like your eyes eat along. So if you just smash something on, I mean, if you're hungry for a smash burger, fine. But if you are enjoying atmosphere and an environment mm -hmm. and the plate, uh, it's it's a picture. Yeah. It's a It must be. A p otherwise, your appetite may go away also very quickly. So... I can see actually a very great connection to art history uh, and chef uh, cooking is creative. Uh, um, it's also somewhat artistic. So uh, if you have both the ingredient side and then all the arrangement side, I cannot get any better. It, it's fun to do. You yeah. know, it's, and I always say uh, one of the first chefs I worked for in Colorado was the, it was a restaurant called the Keystone Ranch. It was five diamond restaurant. Um, intimidating for me to walk in that kitchen. As that was the first kitchen that they put me in as an apprentice. And it was a full grade kitchen. You know, we, we had, it was very intimidating. But I felt like I learned so much from those folks. And that chef in particular, uh, he loved to make fun of my Minnesota accent. He'd say oofda all the time and <laughs> farm girl. Um, <laughs> so uh, Kitchens can be very rough. Very rough. Very rough. Mm -hmm. I worked in a kitchen before and chefs are, um, they have a dirty mouth. Oh yeah. In Europe yep. at least. Uh, not that they're dirty at all. They're clean, but like they're dirty mouth. Oh yeah. And uh, and they can they push you around, they scream and yell and throw and threaten and Right? <laughs> you are absolutely right. You speak, that you speak loud and fast and get your point taken and nobody's mad. You just do that. And then at the end, the end of the night everybody is happy. At eleven PM <laughs> yep. when it's over and you had clean, clean up. for an hour, then you still sit down and everybody's it's not yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very it's a culture in there. It is. It's a yeah, it's yeah, very, I've been very there. intense uh, at times. So. Yep. I, I mm -hmm. But it, that's okay. But one one thing he told me, I would think I was working the cold food station and they they salads were beautiful. And as a young apprentice, and I see this a lot with new cooks, a lot of times people get excited about making this food. They, they forget about the simplicity that if you buy good ingredients, if you buy good food, it's good on its own. And his philosophy was like, this product is excellent. It's going to take you to ruin it. And, and I didn't get it at the time. I was offended. And I was like, you mean I don't... You, you don't want me to try to cook this? Like, and I would make a vinaigrette, or I'd want to marinate everything. Or, and, and I didn't quite understand what flavors went well together. So, and that's a new cook, a concept to new cooks oftentimes. The, they think the more ingredients, the better. the better it will be. And it's like, you, you, all it needs is olive oil, salt, and pepper. Right. You know, that's all that needs. And they're like, are you serious? You don't know, when, drown it in ranch. Right, right. When that, this uh, ver, uh, roast vegetable, um, dish I put on the menu is exactly that you know it's it's all the vegetables that taste good on their own the beets are roasted with olive oil salt and pepper the sweet potatoes it's a sweet potato mash butter salt and pepper you know it's like it, so it tastes like itself yeah but it all those together go together now I could have put curry powder and this and that and whatnot all in it and I would have done that 25 years ago and that particular chef would have been like, well, you wrecked it. <laughs> I don't know why you did that. Um, so I, uh, I really go by that philosophy. If you buy good ingredients, and we do. Um, it's all fresh. Local. It's all fresh. Um, as much as local, local as, as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a dish on the menu, which goes back to the Colorado days, and I was really, really excited to source it out. Um, the sunfish sandwich that I put on there once in a while. Around here, everybody thinks the sunfish is our uh, nice little pan fish, which my kids who all like to fish and bluegills pan you know the sunfish that's fantastic this particular product i get out of hawaii and it's a big ocean fillet it's an ocean sunfish and it it goes off the boat packed and shipped overnight to us really? and it's it, i don't know if you've had it yet but it's so no. cool and it's again it's that really weird whimsical part of me that this fillet is so big 
And then we have this tiny little bun. It's not tiny, it's our, big, it's our burger bun, but the filet is big, so it just, it's kind of like, how do you eat the sandwich? You know, and we do a charred lemon with it and the homemade tartar sauce. It's, it's really a kind of a wowzer dish that goes out because they're expecting our little panfish. And they're like, where do you get the sunfish? And I'm like, oh, I, I, I'm always going to be honest to where I got it. It's just this product that I love, and I sourced it from Hawaii. But, you know, I can get sunfish from, weirdly, I can't buy or use sunfish from our lakes here. But the closest would be like Maury's. I could get it out of uh, their fish market. And then I believe they get theirs from Canada. Oh, so, really? And I always laughed about that, too. Uh, when I lived in Colorado, we would serve Minnesota walleye at the resort. Red, the Red Lake walleye, which is famous. It's great walleye. In Fargo, we had a hard time getting that. All of our walleye in Fargo had to come out of Canada, which markets are just weird. I don't know. Huh. <laughs> so, you know, so anyway, locally, yes, we do as much as we can. We work um, a lot of our, our, the ground beef, the, even our ice cream, you know, things like that. We, we try to pick our Minnesota, if we can get lakes, country products, we certainly do. Um, maple syrup, all those good things. Wild rice, you know. Yeah. I try to put all of our Minnesota things on the menu. And so. so what I miss most, or like, have you been to Europe? I have not. My husband has, and that's on my wish list. <laughs> so so um, it's just uh, like we have very seasonal menus. Uh, for example, like, um, what is it? Uh, every Mars, Juni. Every, um, there's uh, mussels is um, Merz, what is it? There's every, um, Februar. Every uh, month with an R in the end in German is uh, Muscle Month. Oh, yes. But it's, it's when you can catch yeah. it. It's like uh, Jan Januar, Februar, and then, uh, it's actually only in the winter, I guess. I don't know, uh, November, October, November, December, Januar, Februar, that's it. That's yeah. when you get mussels from the Netherlands or the North Shore. Uh, so that's seasonal, or like a green coal, it's a, a green cabbage, it's uh -huh. like a, but it's uh, with a, so that's in the fall. Uh, uh, so there's a certain, or asparagus is always, I think, in May. Yeah, May but we have best. white asparagus. Yeah. We, we don't have green asparagus, or oh. very little. So we have white asparagus, it's different, it grows inside the ground. Sure, yeah. So, uh, so my point is like we have extremely seasonal uh, uh, kitchen and menus, because it's always getting whatever they get. So are you, will you be trying to, um, you know, because nowadays we have access to food year round because of the warmer states or right. like in Mexico, uh, like you always get a tomato whenever, right. of course, right. nowadays, that's what we expect. But uh, we will be following the European um, calendar, calendar, exactly. <laughs> calendar, sorry. I don't know how to do it otherwise, to be honest. Okay. You know, I mean, I've never... Our, our restaurants in Fargo-Moorhead didn't operate that way. Um, maybe the hotel did a little bit more, but um, it, that was more, it's, you know, nationwide sort of chain. Um, they did give us freedom in the, in, at the Marriott, the restaurant that's in there, Urban 42. Um, we had freedom with that menu to uh, structure it seasonally. Mm -hmm. um, that's exactly what I'm going to do at Blackboard. Uh, right now we have asparagus usually as our seasonal veg but i'm watching that very closely if it starts to come in and i don't like the quality which it that's exactly what happens you know it's good during the spring season it's still good right now probably in the next couple weeks it'll get woody and thick that's the product we'll be getting in the price will go up and then i don't want it anymore right you know then it's like okay you know, and um, one of the one of our cooks that works with us very closely um, asked me when when I was going to get carrots in for the veg, and I said I'll probably do carrots in the fall. Like it's a root vegetable. It's you know harvest season is coming up. Summer people are harvesting it now locally, and even more so in August. So we'll see. You know, I just kind of go with the right what, time. The right time. You know, I look at it, it's seafood in particular. You brought up the mussels. That is, that's really a fun market watch to me. I think I'm going to. I, I watch it all the time. I can get uh, rainbow trout right now, um, and I wish I could get the rainbow trout out of Bad Medicine Lake up north here. But <laughs> my kid goes and uh, catches it. Uh, but I don't think I can serve it in the restaurant. However, I looked at the prices, and it's coming down in price because it's people are catching it. So we will have rainbow trout on the menu within the next two weeks. Oh. Um, that way, I, and the walleye. I see a lot of trout on the menus here. 
No one, and I don't know why it's so good. I know it's so it's good. A, it's like a, <laughs> a specialty. Like I grew up, my my father loves trout. Yeah, it's fantastic. So you will have it. Good. And now I'm debating. This is such a Midwestern thing because I love the whole fish head on. Yes, that's what we get in <laughs> and Europe. And the presentation, I'm just I'm like crazy about that. And then you just dig in. Um, it's a lot of work with the with the um, bones and stuff. Yeah, you have to kind of, and I just don't think people are going to be used to it. So I probably won't bring in the head on fish. You know, maybe if I know you're coming, Dirk. Maybe you can. Yeah, <laughs> I would. I would ask you. I would tell you in advance. Maybe you can make it an option. It's we can make it an option. For the person who really enjoys it. Yeah. And then, you know, the others I can play. and Maybe we uh, get them to enjoy it. Well, I think that's it. I think it, it's not something folks are really familiar with. And so it would be unique, again, to Blackboard. Um, I think maybe your audience, and I've watched it time, times, a few times, um, and no offense, uh, but the dining experience uh, locally is more of a, a food necessity at times when people just want to kill their hunger or serve their hunger where in Europe you go late and you make it an it's an easy two hour sitting oh yeah and hello right and uh, and for me uh, whenever they bring uh, like in Europe uh, and maybe some people who have travels uh, it's, it's, it's just an experience in Europe when you bring the bill it's a kick out like you just don't do that right it's like uh, you get offended when you say oh any room for dessert no here's the bill it's like is that the do you want me to leave <clears throat> yeah I, it took me 10 years to kind of just uh, adapt to they don't mean bad but <clears throat> it, it feels awkward to me it felt so but I think uh, people uh, in your uh, restaurant come also for the dining experience and I'm saying that <clears throat> because a fish with head on is more work mm -hmm. it it's a celebration I'm sorry my throat <clears throat> <clears throat> so <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> so Mm -hmm. So it's more, um, it takes a while, but right. it's more of like everything. Everybody should not be done in 35 seconds with their plate. Right. So you enjoy and you gather and you celebrate the moment, right? That's absolutely right. But I think your audience uh, is, uh, your audience has been a little bit like that I already. Think, I think they are. I think it's very mixed is what I'm finding and it, it's okay. And that's, uh, and we're, we're struggling with that a little bit in training also with our staff. Uh, a lot of it is how to read your guest. Um, are they here for that experience? And some are. And some will, if, if that server doesn't get right to them with that bill, as soon as they clear their plates, they're up at the bar with their credit card, shaking their hand like, we are done. She walked right by us, we're done eating. And it's like, okay, like you, how, that's a hard thing to train. It's a hard time to balance. It takes a lot. Of, yeah, yeah. I get it. So it's like you have to somehow read the guests, and you can kind of tell like, are they one that's going to, you know, order a? Um, do they want their drink first, and do they want to enjoy their drink while they peruse the menu? And, um, I, you know, I if I may interrupt, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, so it's very interesting. You you try, and I don't want to critique you. You try to please everyone individually. Right. In my opinion, you. Base, it's you own it, you run it, you're the artist. Uh, if the people want to come, they they need to like they can't come because of that. Maybe okay. maybe uh, so. It's like uh, I'm pretty stubborn. People m often don't like me for that, uh, <laughs> but that's a risk that I take uh, willingly. So um, one could do a little introduction. Hello, welcome to Blackboard. I hope you brought some time. We definitely will not rush you. Yeah. So come here for the experience. Um, I will try to have the best eye contact I have, so I'll, I will notice when you uh, have some need, but I want you to enjoy the evening. Um, um, uh, and stuff like that, it's about the introduction too. It is, you're so, right, uh, so that's a good training the, the, uh, the, the, technique. The, <laughs> the thing is, the apprenticeship that you mentioned for your chef, uh, and I understand now that the resort did that to have the best quality for, and they need to do this in-house in the United States because we don't have those things set up. In Germany, we actually famous for that, and we had a little experiment with Minnesota, in fact, to uh, introduce, and there was a bill actually three, four years ago to possibly implement uh, apprenticeship education in Minnesota, it hasn't passed yet, but so my point is we have that for everything. We have that also for the server, mm -hmm. and you are three years in training. So, uh, um, and then they are educated with a degree, and they're hired, and then the people would come work for you, um, it's just what they do. And, and, and the thing is the, cost, the guests, uh, the patrons, 
that's what they expect too. Like when you go in Europe, right. I mean, it, it's it's not an option. It's like I don't care that you like you, Mr. One. So we cannot serve a hundred expectations. No, you're right. absolutely right. Unfortunately, I, I'm happy for you that you brought that up because that's exactly where I'd like to see Blackboard. But it's hard a to. I, I feel like I could train the staff to do it that way, and then it's hard. I, eventually the customers would come around to it. Those that like that service will come. And those that maybe, it's okay. There's many, There's many, so many good options. restaurants. Uh, and like, it's okay if you don't like what we're doing. That's okay. I'm not offended. I think it's actually <laughs> yeah. interesting because sometimes people want to go to an Italian restaurant or a Mexican restaurant or uh, uh, an American restaurant or like, uh, you know what I'm, my point is? So if they don't feel like that kind of experience, then maybe they go to a little bit of a different environment. It could be just one of an option. Look at it as like, welcome to Mexico, like a Mexican restaurant. Right. I mean, like you get different food, you have different music. Exactly. It's different uh, flavors. So it yeah. could, I'm, I'm no. just encouraging you to make it a, a, as unique as you want to be. <laughs> well, I appreciate that very much because, you know, I, honestly, when you start something new and I feel like I have a good idea of what our clients and folks are looking for, but at the same time, I question myself. Terry questions herself. You know, it's... Um, everybody has an opinion and they want to share it with us and you know what you should do you know what you should do and I love that and at the same time I get done with work at night and I, I'm like god you know did I did we do that right you know and you these were the wins these were the ones that and then do we change it for everybody that didn't particularly like what we did where where was the hiccup was it in communication between the kitchen and the server was it in from you know the server to the guest then you know because everything it goes you know if if we do something wrong in the kitchen and that gets out to the guests and then the server gets flustered all of those feelings go along to that guest experience and so it's um, it all it took a little while to get that in our other restaurants and all of a sudden it just clicked and people knew what to expect and I feel like that's going to happen at Blackboard we just are going through this phase of and then to make it harder on top of it on Saturday every you know it, it's great everybody's wearing masks but communication all of a sudden changes even more like you said now it's a lot of eye contact like can you as the guest hear the server when they're talking you know can you you know a lot of variables a lot of news yeah. new things so it's you know it's different things and different kind of dining I'm worried on Saturday we we have calls from the county they're going to be out inspecting making sure that we're following the Minnesota guidelines which we will which also includes you know no large group tables well, you know, last night we, we had a great night, but we had a lot of families and groups start moving tables together. So all of a sudden, our six feet apart tables was a group of 12, a group of 15, you know, and it's like, we're not gonna, now I figure, I need to figure out the dialogue to go to the guests and say, I'm so sorry. You know, it's, it's not an option. It's not an option. And do we put a sign on the table that looks tacky? I don't know. Yeah, Is that no. what we do? Um, <clears throat> but we don't need to go in depth. My, the no. most important, uh, uh, like the very interesting part is how much, despite the fact that you have a lot of experience, how unique every new environment is and how much work behind the scenes. I mean, that's what we discover here. It's not just always, oh, there's a kitchen, there's a table, and then we <laughs> cook and bring. So there's so much more work to setting it up and you're so new. I mean, you open for, I think, barely four weeks. Right. And um, uh, uh, still getting in the groove. It's it's a fascinating story to me and I, I respect very much the hard work and, uh, uh, and the experience that the customer will have. Regardless, one little beautiful, uh, unique item, I think, tell us about what happens at the end with the children before they leave the schoolhouse. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah, we have our little sweet shop, um, which is, a uh, just kind of nostalgic for Terry and I again. Um, when I was a, a kid, what my grandparents had a lake house on uh, Pelican Lake. It was a cottage. It was I have so many good memories. But when uh, Grandma would start to get, well, she wasn't getting tired or anything. Maybe we were restless. You know, the, all the grandchildren. We got out of the lake and we're all of a sudden we're all in there. And she would go. And we, we would see her doing it. Go over to her change jar, and we knew she was going to give us change to walk down. You know, to the resort to the candy store, and it was. That was so fun. It was like, she's, got it. she's getting the money. She's getting the money. And it was just quarters. And we'd all walk down there with our quarters and get our, 
you know, penny candy, basically. And so that's what Terry and I kind of wanted to recreate. We had the school theme going on, and I said, let's have a candy store for the kids. We don't really have much yet. I'm not a pastry chef, so our desserts, um, Terry, thank goodness, likes to do cookies, and so we have our ice cream sandwiches right now and, and the candy store. Um, but you don't have to pay. You don't. The kids can come and they can, um, we either can put a bag together for them. If they know, if they look at the options, they can tell us what they want and, and they get to leave or, or go sit on the lawn and enjoy their bag of candy. Yeah, um, that is so cute. It's really fun. And we've had a lot of fun like sourcing some of our old favorites. It's like, where can we get Astro Pops? That was my <laughs> favorite thing to buy when I was a kid and I found them and my 10 year old and I each had one and I, I, bite hard, hard candy instead and I know I shouldn't like my dentist would hate that and so I went to go take a bite out of the sucker and I was like oh my god don't do that you'll break your teeth <laughs> you know I was like this is like <laughs> it's a good I was like it's not it's not to eat fast um but we we just laughed and I said oh my gosh already half of them are gone I hoped none of these kids with braces got them and their parents are gonna kill me <laughs> but I think it was a very sweet story Harry went there um, I, I asked Terry to reduce the size of the bag by at least oh, half because, that's hilarious uh, because uh, uh, yeah it's modest but like uh, she gave us a huge bag and I gave it right back <laughs> she gave it to kids a group of three kids Harry doesn't eat that much anyways and sweets but it was so cool and I enjoyed it I thought that was a very unique touch Oh. that's where you see the personality in the establishment mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see to watch it grow and and become more um, it's established even yeah. tell us about the hours right now I think you you open Wednesday through Sunday Wednesday through Saturday Saturday yeah so um, just for dinner right now four to nine the bar stays open later we've had some neighbors come for drinks um, we have some of the bar snacks out um, if somebody would ask, we do have frozen pizza in the freezer. I don't, you know, if someone's in there at 10 o'clock at night and I'm gone and they're like, oh, we're starving, but we want to have a couple more drinks, we'll throw in a frozen pizza for you. That's silly, but we kind of, you know, yeah, if sure. they want that, um, we'll have it there. Um, What's with the winter? Are you going to be open year round? I'm so excited for winter. I really am. And people are worried for us. That's what we keep hearing. And I said, well, I am envisioning this. Well, like you're from Europe, so and maybe it's the Colorado part of me or the, some of the nor northern Minnesota. I'm envisioning kind of a small little destination. The dining room is small. It's cozy. It's, um, you know, we maybe can serve, have six tables in there at once um, without it feeling too crowded. But we'll be open all winter. We'll do um, special, really special menus. Uh, we'll have special events. I'll probably do prefix menus once in a while, and we'll get that out in advertising. Um, and just take reservations only. Like I'll, I'll sell 30 tickets. This is the menu. Come if you want. Um, one of our really good friends, Jean Taylor, is a sommelier in Fargo Moorhead. She curated our whole wine list. Um, she brings in a lot of unique things, and she is such a fun person to listen to. So anyone that's interested in wine, trying new things, we'll bring Jean out, and we'll do some pairings. Um, we'll do probably some beer pairings too. We'll maybe hit the Oktoberfest um, kind of scene. And I think it'd be perfect with our yard if we yeah. can get a nice night uh, to do some fun stuff out with them yeah. um, and kind of go with the seasons and different things and say, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. We have um, neighbors down the road that have uh, horses and would do sleigh rides. We're hoping to collaborate with them on some fun events where maybe it's a sleigh ride and a dinner event, um, bringing again the experience to life it's not just coming over for dinner we're going to show you an experience and no. and that's what we're going to do all winter and i'm we'll get through the season we'll be just fine <laughs> Love so, it. yeah um, so we'll be t in touch with you and you can maybe help us market our ideas or yeah. come up with some good things too i would love to <laughs> i would love to and i will communicate whatever uh, i i can absolutely Great. no i'm i like winters here a lot i like the seasons year round uh, every um time has a good to it i mean yeah. like fall is coming up with the change of colors and you're right by maplewood state park i mean you will yeah. be a destination you're in a very good location and i i hope uh, to be able to come every week if i can if i don't take away all the space for the oh guests never like you I, can come whenever you yeah, want we i'm excited like that. <laughs> i'm excited to, to have you here so yeah um uh, tell us one uh, usually i close out um what makes lakes country what's your lake experience uh what makes the lake so special to you lake oh, life what does that mean to you you know it, it goes back to growing up going to the lake 
you know, that was always a big highlight um, when my dad was a farmer, uh, and, and so near Fargo Moorhead area, Glendon specifically, and there were days where my mom would, it would be hot in the summer and she would just tell us all like, get in the car, we're going to the lake. And we would go for a week, you know, or more, and, and, and every weekend, and my dad would work in the field and he'd come down late at night and we would look forward to it. We would play all day and grandma and grandpa were there, my cousins, it was just very much a family place. Um, and dad would get there at night and we'd have a campfire and he'd get up at the crack of dawn to get back to the farm, but all these memories um, are so special. And then after traveling, you know, living in Minneapolis, which was fantastic, I loved it. Uh, then moving out to Colorado and then coming back home and, uh, and my parents decided to build a family home on Spirit Lake. And for all of us, it's become a huge gathering place. And so again, it's like all of that stuff that we're trying to recreate for our kids, kind of those same memories. Um, and I think that's how a lot of people feel out here is just the nostalgic, mm -hmm. um, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. we, in Minnesota, we go to the lake. It's hot out. What are we going to do? Let's go to the lake. <laughs> and, and in the winter, too. I mean, we have, speaking of Maplewood, they do the candlelight skis. I can't wait to collaborate with them and say, hey, if you go skiing, come in after. We'll have this meal for you. It'll be, you know, a nice, cozy place to come in when you're done skiing. Or before, probably after. But if you want to come before, that's fine. Um, no, we're I'm... right down the road. Come over. If you want to, we have five acres. Maybe we can talk them into just doing a little ski trail around our area. If you want to come ski over there, snowshoeing, you know, I like to do all of that. I, I guess I'm just a total northern girl. I like all the winter sports and yeah. my kids are all Nordic skiers. So they race and um, I don't know. I don't like to race, but they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, no fun. Well, yeah. I hear there's a lot of things to uh, to experience with you and uh, yeah, welcome to the area. I guess. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks again for coming out and telling your story and um, have a good weekend ahead. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this was already our uh, newest episode of the Lake Life Weekend podcast. We sure hope you enjoyed it. Uh, tune in again next week with another great guest and updates. Always check out our website, uh, lakelifeweekend.com. And if you have some comments, please feel free to email us at hello at lakelifeweekend.com. And uh, you have a wonderful weekend ahead. <laughs>